now we want like, we want uh, Wi-Fi in our vehicles, right? We want them to be Bluetooth compatible. We want two or three sunroofs. Why in the world we need those? I don't know, but we want them. We want our seats to heat up when it's cold and we want them to cool down when it's hot. We want all these cool things like two screens with a DVD player in your car. You want all those things, right? And so what you do is you research and you research and research and you find the exact car that you want and maybe it's like 2,326 miles away, but you're like, I don't care. That's the one I want. And so you have it ordered and delivered or you think I'm going to fly somewhere, get that car and drive it home because that's the one I want. Anybody ever done anything dumb like that before? You're not going to raise your hands for that, are you? Yeah, we do, because that's the one we want. Now, we go out and we buy that vehicle or we buy that house or we buy that whatever, and then we, after the fact, say, whoa, that's a little bit more than I wanted to spend on it. So, God, will you help me make enough money to afford the thing that I just went in debt to purchase. Or maybe we begin a new relationship and say, God, will you please bless this relationship? I want to do it, I want to do this your way. Or we start a new job and ask God, will you work in this job so that I can provide for my family? You see, we go ahead and we move forward and we make decisions, and then after the fact, we say, God, I want you to bless this. I want you to bless my decision that I made without asking you first. And perhaps. It's not working sometimes because we attempted to do things on our own without consulting the God who loves us enough to bring us out of slavery. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 put it this way. They say, hey Bob, you got that one? Hey, there it is. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Say the yellow part with me. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. There's this cool promise here that if we acknowledge God in every aspect of our life, he promises to follow through by making our path straight. Now, it might not be the exact way we want, but it's the exact way he wants, and that's better for us. And so, we often think, well, God has a lot bigger and better things to do than to be involved in every aspect of my daily life. Does he? Sure. But he wants an intimate relationship with his people who, in all our ways, acknowledge him first. The second thing I want you to write down today is this. Give God the first dime of every dollar. Will you read that one out loud with me? Give God the first dime of every dollar. Only 13 people said that in first service. We had like 16 this time. Nice job, right? Yeah, we don't want to read that one. And this one makes us uncomfortable. Really? Give God 10% of everything first? I don't know about you, but I got big problems with this one because it hurts. And it sounds like sacrifice. And that makes us all kinds of uncomfortable. But the truth is, the Bible talks about money probably more than most subjects altogether. And there's a reason for that, I believe. See, I think the way we use money is so closely tied with worship that I don't believe we ever completely understand a relationship with God unless we understand that the money in our wallets or in our checking account or wherever is not ours. The Bible presents this idea that the money we have is actually given to us, not on loan, but as stewards, we are entrusted with God's resources. And if that's true, then God has some expectations of how we use that money. Malachi chapter 3 is a really interesting passage of scripture. Malachi is a prophet from the Old Testament. And it's actually the last little book in the Old Testament, right before we hit the New Testament. And, and there's this strange conversation that's happening between God and his people. And uh, God says this, ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. And this makes sense. If you read through the Old Testament, the time and time again, the Israelite people had a really rough time being faithful to God. And so there's this cycle where they would be faithful for a little while, but things would be good. And then they would begin making unfaithful uh, decisions that would 
require them to hit rock bottom where then they would be asking God for help again. And there's just this ongoing cycle that many of us have probably experienced in life. Things are good, we forget that we need God. And so we begin making dumb decisions. And when we hit rock bottom, we're like, God, I need you. And so he follows suit because he's faithful. And the Israelites had this cycle going on all through the Old Testament. And God says, ever since the time of your fathers, from the very beginning... You have turned away from me and you've abandoned my decrees and you haven't kept them. And he says, return to me and I will return to you. But you ask, God says, but but you ask, well, how are we supposed to do that? How are we to return? Look what he says next in tithes and offerings. God's answer to the question, how do we come back to you, God? God says, with your money. Because I, I know that hurts. And I know that sounds like sacrifice. And I know that if you put your money where your mouth is and you actually give back to me in the way that I want you to, it's going to require a heart change. And so God says, return to me in tithes and offerings. He says, you're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then he says this, test me in this. God asks us to test his faithfulness When it comes to our money. The Old Testament laid out hard lines about the use of money. In fact, the tithe, which was 10% straight off the top, was an absolute mandatory part of their worship. And God made it pretty clear that if his people weren't giving 10% of their earnings back to him, then they were simply cheating him. Now... We get to the New Testament, and it's kind of it's kind of this gray area where we say, "Well, there's there's no demand in the New Testament that says we should give ten percent back to God." But let me ask you something this morning: Are you comfortable looking at Old Testament things and saying the principles behind them have? Nothing to do with the way I live my life now. Are you comfortable doing that? You just rip the Old Testament out of your Bibles and burn it if you're comfortable with that. You guys want to do that today? A little sacrificial offering? No, you're not. That scares us half to death to even think about that. So, so why does this tie, this 10% principle, get manipulated when we get to the New Testament and we say that doesn't apply to us? We have so many bills. We have so many responsibilities. There are all these things I don't, think I, can, I don't think I can bring the whole tithe to God. I just, I just can't do that. Well, I th- think the reason that we're so uncomfortable to even consider that is because there are other gods that we've placed before God. The money, I would say, is our biggest. And the only way to properly dethrone the God of money is to give to the one true God first. Third thing I want you to write down today is this. Give God the first place in every relationship. And this is with your parents, with your kids, with your spouse, with your friends. I want you to see what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. He says, Do not suppose that I came to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now I read that verse, and I'm thinking, what now? Because do you remember when Jesus was born, the whole manger scene situation, the first Christmas? One of the things that the angels proclaimed that day was peace on where? Earth and goodwill to men. And we said that the peace on earth was Jesus, was God in flesh coming to the earth. But now Jesus is preaching and he says, I didn't come to bring peace to the earth. I came to bring a sword. And we read that and we think, what on earth are you talking about? Because those two things don't go hand in hand. Listen to what he says next. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And we read these words of Jesus and they're really hard to swallow and understand because I think we're so focused on here and now that we forget that we're living for eternity. You see, 
Jesus did come to bring peace. But it wasn't just for now. It wasn't just for today. It was for all eternity, which means that if we're living for peace for all eternity, then that affects the way we live now. And many times that's not going to be peaceful. You see, you've probably felt some divisiveness with your family or your coworkers or your friends or maybe even your spouse when someone in that relationship doesn't agree with the way you've prioritized Jesus in your life. That rubs people the wrong way. It makes them ask questions and it causes division. And Jesus said, expect that to happen. Because peace now isn't always possible. But you're living for peace for all eternity. Give Jesus your first priority and he will, I believe, honor that both here and forever. Fourth thing I want you to write down today is this. Give God the first minutes of every day. Raise your hand if you're a morning person up in here. Most of you aren't because you're at second service, right? I asked that in first service and most of them raised your hand or their hands. Yeah, we're not morning people because we're at the 1030 service, but uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 35 is this interesting little verse about Jesus' ministry. It says, read the yellow part with me, very early in the morning, right, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Truth is, we see this happening several times in Jesus' ministry. Times when he withdrew from people because he had to spend some time with his father one-on-one, -on -one, where he would spend that time in prayer, and most of the time, he did it very early in the morning because people were still in bed. Now, I understand that you might not be a morning person, and I understand that some of you have young kids, and so mornings at your house look more like the circus than they do life, right? That's how it looks at my house. And so finding those times very early in the morning isn't always possible, and so instead of thinking that I have to give God the first minutes of my day, perhaps what we should think is, I must give God the best minutes of my day. And maybe that's early in the morning, maybe it's late at night, somewhere, or maybe it's somewhere in between. Maybe you only have five minutes a day when it's just not like, ah! right? If that's the case, don't beat yourself up thinking, well, I'm never going to be that spiritual person that I'm supposed to do because I'm not spending an hour in prayer. Instead, give God the best of you for just a few minutes and watch what he does with that time. The fifth and last thing I want you to write down today is this. Give God the first call in everything. When I went to college, my uh, dad had made it very clear that any amount of money I needed to fulfill my college obligations was on me. The cool thing about growing up in my household is that through high school... My parents told, told us, you know, we, we will take care of high school. You can be involved in extracurriculars, all that good stuff. You don't have to have a job. We'll help you out with all of those things through high school. But once you hit college, you're on your own. Right? That, that is on your dime. And, and growing up, I thought, that's a good deal. Because I saw a lot of my high school friends having to do jobs, and they couldn't get involved in stuff. And I was like, man, I'm glad that's not me until I got to college. It's like a whole, a whole new world. Right? And so my junior year of college, up until that time, it was okay. I, I applied for student loans. I got those. It was taken care of. I'd find part-time jobs, you know, all that kind of stuff. But my junior year in college, uh, before I left the, the sophomore year of college, I did all I could to line it up so that all of my ducks were in a row when I came back to school. I made sure that I had the specific dorm room I wanted. I made sure that I had a job when I came back to school. I made sure that I had all the exact classes that I wanted. And I had all of these ducks in a row. And so I go to college, first day, junior year, and I walk into the registration area. The first place is they take a picture, right? And they put that on your student ID and hand it to you. And you go to the next table, and if I remember correctly, it was like the registrar's table. And so you just reviewed your classes to make sure you had the right ones. Check, 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 check. Yep, good to go. Move to the next table, and you know they took care of your dorm room, made sure you had your keys and all the stuff that you needed for that. And then that last table was financial aid. Dun, dun, dun. Right? I thought everything was good to go. 
Until the lady looked at me and she said, you can't go to class tomorrow until you come up with about $3,500. Just all over her table. It was like the tater tot casserole revisited. I didn't really throw up on her table, but that's what I felt like. I, uh, I had a moment. And I went back to my dorm room. They actually let me in, even though I hadn't paid for it. I went to my dorm room, and I just had like, a crybaby moment. I just let her rip on my knees, mad at everyone, including God, saying, why, why? You know, why did this happen? Why isn't it working out the way I had planned? I had all my ducks in a row. You know, God, I'm giving my life to you. I'm going into ministry. Why, 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 why? Balling, balling. And this still small voice in my head says, call your dad. Nope. Not doing it. Made it very clear that college is on my dime. I'm, I got this. I'm a big boy. I'm going to handle this. God, what am I supposed to do? Call your dad. Nope, not doing it. College is on my dime. That's what he's made crystal clear from the very beginning. I'm not going to do it. Call your dad. So I picked up the phone. Trying to choke him down. I don't want to cry when I call dad. And I called dad. And I don't remember a lot of the conversation other than I was scared to death. And he said this. We'll figure it out. And I've often wondered how that would have turned out had I not prayed first. Now, I don't really want to know. But I think that God was working not just in my heart, but also in my relationship with my dad and how all that plays out. Working in ways I never anticipated and I, and I didn't expect. Why? Because I called God first. It's not always going to work out so easy. And it's not always going to be minor things like how to come up with some money to pay for college. There are going to be smaller things and there are going to be bigger things for every single one of us. But who do you call first? Is it somebody else that you trust or is it God? Psalm 50 verse 15 says this. Call upon me. Read the red, yellow part with me. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and then you will honor me. Philippians 4 puts it this way. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, yeah, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Read those yellow words, in everything, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. My question to you today is, what area of your life do you need to turn over to God? Five things we've written down. Give God the first priority in everything. Give God the first dime of every dollar. Give God the first place in every relationship. Give God the first minutes of every day. Give God the first call when you have a problem. What area of your life is lagging behind because you're still trying to control it yourself? I want you to focus on one of these areas this week. Don't, my, don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't think, man, I got a lot of work to do. Focus on one. Turn that over to him. Quit bowing down to other gods, whether that's yourself, your job, your relationships, your money, your gifts, your talents. Do not have any other gods before him. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us, for being patient with us, we, are no, we know that uh, we're a hard bunch to work with because we know ourselves. And we know our hearts and we know how jaded they often are. And we know that we've bowed down before other gods numerous times. They might not have a name like Baal or Asherah or Molech, but they certainly have a face. And they might look like money. They might look like relationships. They might look like our own abilities and talents. They might look like our own power and our own pride. Whatever those gods are that we've been bowing before, help us this week to realize it. Help us to come to a point where we say, yeah, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of bowing down before other gods. I'm guilty of putting those things before you. And when we do that, God, we trust that you will do something about it.
We trust the way that you work through your spirit. And we pray that this week will be a brand new one for each of us. And we'll come to the realization of those areas of our lives where we've been holding on instead of letting you reign supreme. Again, we thank you for your patience. Help us to be more like Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. few announcements we'd like to share with you before uh, we get out of here today. First of all, if you're new around here and you do not have a rockin' cool welcome home t-shirt yet, we want to hook you up with one. So uh, out in the main lobby over here, there's a little welcome center, and uh, we got some t-shirts in various sizes in three cool colors, and we want you to wear one. So stop by there if you don't have one yet, pick one up. Um, also, uh, coming up this week, lots of things. I'm going to turn, turn it over to Lucas for a few announcements real quick. Thanks, Mitchell. Just want to let you all know that today starts junior high alpha week out at uh, Shelby County Christian Assembly. So we're going to be taking a van uh, for any students going, uh, try to be here on 2 and then we'll leave about 2.15, get, uh, get to the camp then. And then we want to let you know that next week, 5th and 6th grade alpha week is beginning as well. And we'll have a van and shuttle prepared to take students out. And this announcement is going to come from the Children's Ministry Department, um, where next week we're going to have our uh, new check-in system for um, the, the children's church. So if you're a parent who sends their kids to, to junior church, just be prepared next week to, to learn something new. Chet, then uh, check your student in before. So stay tuned for more information and have a great week. Thank you, sir. Uh, I believe that's just about it. Vacation Bible School is coming up in the near future. If you haven't signed up to help, we encourage you to do that out in the main lobby. Also, this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in the Family Life Center, uh, the women's ministry is going to be having a planning meeting. So, ladies, if you want to get in on what's happening over the next year or so, jump into that. That's, again, Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Have a blessed week. God, we love you so much. Uh, we thank you for loving us. Help us to live our lives this week, um, not putting any other gods before you, but allowing you to be our first priority um, with our money, with our relationships, with our time, with our energy, with our focus. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. 